a pleasure to introduce this uh, seminar speaker today, as well as the seminar series. And just let me tell you a little bit about this, uh, the seminar series, before we get started. Uh, it, it's quite clear, uh, given the economic conditions, given the constraints of society that are ongoing now, that uh, the days of scientists uh, simply pursuing whatever they're interested in and expecting society to pay for that are really over. Uh, we've really got to be studying important problems, and important problems are not the things that necessarily interest us and pique our curiosity. Important problems are the ones that are defined by the needs of society. So an important part of uh, MDIBL's mission and vision going forward is to actually make sure our scientists here are, wherever possible, translating their discoveries uh, into new technologies, into new solutions to problems uh, that are important needs in society today. So I've done a number of things over the last year to stimulate and encourage this kind of thinking, and one of the things was to establish a new seminar series, uh, which I call the Business of Science. And it's a series of uh, formal and informal conversations, again, about the idea of what discovery is all about and how we can translate that discovery into new solutions. Uh, we had our first one, it's an in informal conversation, with uh, Bob Morris and David Hazinga at a science cafe a couple of weeks ago, and they talked about this uh, notion that, there, that people think there's this uh, distinction between basic and applied research. And I think they completely eradicated the notion that there is a difference betwe between the two. It's really part of the whole same spectrum of discovery and then application of that discovery to solving important problems. So our first uh, uh, formal speaker today is uh, Dr. George Prendergast, who is the uh, CEO of the uh, Lankenau Institute for Medical Research. Uh, Dr. Prendergast uh, began his scientific career. He did his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania in biochemistry in 1983. From there, he did a very quick uh, master's degree in molecular biophysics at Yale University, and from there went on to do a PhD in molecular biology at Princeton University in 1989. Uh, after that, he went on to do postdoctoral research at New York University Medical Center, and from there he went into industry. Uh, he joined the uh, Department of Cancer Research at uh, Merck Research Laboratories. In 1983, he went back to academia. Uh, he went and became a faculty member at the Worcester Institute, where he rose to the level of associate professor, and also was named a, a Pew Scholar in Biomedical Sciences in 1995. In 1999, he went back to industry, and he became a uh, the director of the cancer research group at the DuPont Pharmaceutical Company. And then in 2004, uh, he became professor and president and CEO of the Lankenau Institute. And in 2006, he joined the faculty of the Department of Pathology, Anatomy, and Cell Biology at uh, Jefferson Medical School and Thomas Jefferson University. His research interest is focused broadly on cancer biology. Uh, he's particularly interested in uh, signal transduction mechanisms and molecular therapeutics. He's published over 140 papers in the field of cancer research, and he is an inventor and co-inventor on uh, 30 published or pending uh, patents. In 2012, he was the recipient of the uh, Jefferson Medical School uh, Kimmel Cancer Center's uh, Inventor of the Year Award. And I think I met George probably a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken, and we got talking and we talked about academia versus industry, and he liked both as aspects of both sort of approaches. And when he came to the Lankenau, he actually combined the two. And he established something called acupreneurial approach to uh, biomedical research. And it's an approach, as his title of his talk today will indicate to you, is an important one for the changing times we now live in. And he's going to talk to us about that today. Thank you, George. Welcome. Thanks, Kevin, <laughs> and thank you uh, to you and, and, and Mr. Morris, a board member we share, and to your staff and uh, uh, faculty students here. It's been a wonderful visit and very stimulating to hear about the science here. I think you have a wonderful organization, and uh, it was really great to be able to come up here and see it, what you're doing, because I think we share a lot of the same uh, general goals for what we're trying to do in science. Today's lecture is rather a challenge for me because I'm not a businessman by training, and a lot of what I'm going to tell you was sort of made up as a result of my experience in two tracks in a career that was in one part uh, industrial and pharmaceutical and another part academic. And the acupreneurial model, as I call it, at Lank and I was really tried an effort of weaving two parts of my life together that I couldn't really work together in either of those two worlds. Uh, 
fortunately for me, <clears throat> I was able to move a group at pharmaceutical industry and a group at Wistar. During that period, I actually had two, and everything moved out to Lankanaw. And the board there and the health system, the mainline health system that supports this institute, were willing to let us try what was, uh, for me, the biggest experiment of my life in putting together these two uh, 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 kinds of uh, visions into a single vision. Uh, Limer at a Glance is a hospital-affiliated nonprofit research organization, has independent governance and owned by a health system. We're affiliated with Thomas Jefferson University, which is uh, one of the bigger medical schools in the US. And so our faculty have appointments at the Jeff Medical School downtown. We're separated about five miles from there. Our theme is a lot like what I heard you are working on to some degree today, disease modifiers. The science of not changing uh, phenotypes through working in pathways that are disease pathways uh, or regulatory pathways in development, but rather the modifiers on those pathways that can change the bandwidth, if you like, in information without changing the information itself. A lot of the pathways we're working on that have to do, in fact, for example, with inflammation relate to that. And we work in three areas that are medicinally related. We're about the same size as you guys. Uh, uh, we have clinical orientation and a public health appointment and a lot of clinical faculty. But on the basic side, the size is much like you are here. Uh, the acupreneurial organization model, which I'm going to talk a lot about today, really has a, a differences that have to do with product development. So every laboratory where, you know, where the PI typically looks for grants and new knowledge uh, in the uh, projects they're engaging, we also look to extract the product development. And there's different ways to think about that I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about. Uh, we mix together a biotech incubator that has 10 startup companies in it, eight that are from outside, they call, I call the spin-ins, and we trade equity in the company for space and services in the startup. Sometimes it's a virtual company, so there's not actually much business, uh, much science going on, it's just business and by contract. But uh, this integrated biotech incubator is unique in the sense that it's mixed into what's otherwise a nonprofit activity. The company is literally next door to the nonprofit laboratory, sometimes from the same faculty member. And the companies we have in the startup are integrated with the institute. One of them is a commercial affairs company, so rather than have a tech transfer office, we actually have a for-profit into which we license everything, and they run the incubator for us. I'll tell you a little bit more about LDI. And then Limer Chemical Genomics Center, which is a, basically a drug discovery service built around a sophisticated robot. I'll tell you a little bit about that, because I think there might be some opportunities for our organizations to interact with LCGC. So again, the entrepreneurial model is really an effort to put together uh, elements of research uh, that are usually separated culturally. Uh, they include, in our case, clinical and public health and a managed care perspective that comes from the clinicians. Uh, uh, about 25% of our institute floor space is dedicated to clinical research, which is typically uh, uh, has a lot of regulatory oversight, a lot of computers, uh, everything happening in the hospital otherwise. Uh, product development, a lot of which is in the biotech incubator and some dedicated space in the nonprofit labs, and of course, what you would recognize here as traditional, more academic oriented nonprofit labs that are supported typically by grants and uh, philanthropy. So, why have it like this? And the reason is because if you want to influence medicine and you're in biomedical research, you have to go through biotech. Everyone knows the, the phrase bench to bedside. Well, bench to bedside has to go through biotech because to get across that gap, you have to have elements that make it possible to raise millions of dollars to get to the chance at a clinical experiment. And that's the reality of our world today. So you need patents because investors want to have uh, observations protected. So if they put money into it, uh, this money is, uh, uh, is going to see an outlet to uh, a return. You need product development to think about practical ways that you can take what is a concept and maybe a rudimentary idea, but something's practical in the real world. And then finally, you need a startup company because in order to put all this together in such a way to raise that money, a corporate entity is very helpful. And having that corporate entity near the nonprofit lab creates a very different kind of conversation because the people who work in companies typically are very focused. They're time and driven. Uh, they're market driven. They're sensitive to cost of goods. They're sensitive to what will actually be bought or used. Scientists tend to be outward looking and their work tends to make them think about lots of options. This tends to be engineering. That's when you want a company. This tends to be research. That's when you want to think, write a grant. So wearing these different hats, as we call them in Limer, uh, interfaces at this kind of a, a, a pressure point, if you like, when we think about, well, what's really a chance for us to put something into clinic to get something back? Well, other reasons for acupreneurialism. As you all know uh, way too well, uh, we need new revenue strain, uh, streams to sustain our missions. The traditional sources of support are narrowing. And the practical impact of, and return on investment is something that's increasingly desired by any supporter, whether that's just the government or a foundation or a family or whoever supports research. They want to see what are you doing. Younger investors 
And younger people generally, who are more technically oriented, who have money, they track more closely. The older generations were, here's the money, God bless for what you're doing, good luck to you. They didn't tend to check in as much. The younger types are very different. They do check in. We have to think about things in a little different way, even if you're a basic scientist as a result. The academic model, there's only one model for biomedical research in the US and most of the world, because the world has adopted the NIH model, which is the academic model. And that's a bad model for invention. It's a bad model because what the academic model is about is the development of knowledge, it's validation. The development specifically, if you're basic researchers, of hypotheses. The purpose of basic research is to develop hypotheses, the value of which is determined by their range of application. So when you think about a research problem, the academic model is very good at getting that knowledge and working within the constrictors of a culture that have to do with knowledge, but not invention. Invention is a useful application of knowledge. So the movement toward that is very difficult and in, imperfect in the uh, situation we find ourselves. Now, I'm, I don't want to cast dispersions on the model, but I want to say it's not a good tool to do what we're trying to do uh, 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 if you're trying to invent and apply. Another reality is that if you're trying to make something practical, there are oppressive legal, regulatory, and financial forces in the world today. And they are squeezing research in different ways. You don't see as much if you work in the lab but it's a real impediment. The reason that there are only about 30 new drugs approved in the US, despite many, many billions of dollars of research, is that it's very hard to get all the way there. The tolerance in all those domains is very low for slip-ups, if you like, and you have to deal with that if you want to think about uh, uh, ways that you want to invent to change the world. And finally, uh, 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 the uh, uh, realities that have to be dealt with are not only markets, but also government. Uh, there are really two forces in the public and private sector. These have to be balanced. There are different people that know more about this uh, kind of thing than others. People in companies are intensely aware relative to people that are on the nonprofit side of, of these challenges. Acupreneurialism is designed to try and get us up close to those issues so we can begin to think our way through what challenges we have to get to. I think the most tenable models have to integrate the two as close as they can and mix the styles of open-ended, long-term, non-ROI oriented research with focused short-term ROI activities that lead to invention that are practical, that can be licensable, that'll lead to products that'll be used by people. The Small Research Inde uh, Independent Research Institute is actually a much better place than a university to do this kind of work, and you and I are very lucky because we work at places like that. Uh, we're much more lithe and capable. We don't have the bureaucracy. We know our colleagues. Something changes in social dynamics in groups above 100. You can see some very interesting sociology about this. And if you're in one of these organizations and you know everyone, communication is possible. Scholarly knowledge is accessible. You don't need to be near a library anymore. We have the internet for that. Collaboration uh, is possible when you're not around the greatest minds. That's what universities used to offer, a culture that you had to be in in order to do knowledge or invention. It was very important to have a critical mass. Today, that's much less important because of the way the world's structure. Universities can't do this intermixture because of their tax status. The IRS says you can have a tax-free status, your nonprofit, because you have an educational mission. And putting a company next door to a nonprofit lab at a university doesn't make too much sense if you're trying to educate. But if your mission like ours is, is healthcare oriented because we're at a hospital. We're affiliated with the university, but that's rather distant. We train, but that's not our primary mission, rather like you are here. Then the mission can drive something that allows a hybrid culture legally. So the lawyers who look at what we're trying to do make these assessments that make it possible for, for us to do something, for you to do something that I think might be a lot different than what a university can do, which is the need to house it in a separate building. Now, you may want to still do that because of the culture you have, but where we were headed was to something where we could put the companies and the nonprofit researchers in the same room so that we have a seminar. Someone would answer, ask the question, you know, what's the competitive uh, technology here? How much does it cost to do this? Who's going to buy this? Is the payer going to pick it up? The insurance companies or Medicare? These are the kinds of things that come up and make for a really interesting discussion when all you're really talking about is the usual science. This stuff comes up. It begins to change the orientation of your thinking and the culture and create some tensions that I think are very healthy. Um, the models incentives we're going to use. How are we going to compensate people to do things? To me, it's an irony having left universities that anyone would ever consider a job where someone would hire you and then say, well, now you have to go out and raise your salary. You know, go get some grants. And with that condition, anything you invent, I own. And uh, we might give you some, something for that. It's a very crazy thing, especially when you think about the culture of a university, which tends to be socialized, tends to be leftist. It's, it is a real problem there, in my mind. Of how, 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 does, how is that going to hang together? I think the academic um, guild this, this, this uh, uh, century, it's going to break down and change. It has to. But for now, 
the fluidity and the things you can try, if you like, uh, the incentives in the models, we can try different things and see what works. We can watch each other. I also think corporate and entrepreneurial relationships can develop much more freely. It took me years to understand that, because old people always had told me, go to a meeting, meet people, get to know your colleagues. And never really, I never understood why that was important. When you're in business or you talk to entrepreneurs or talk to lawyers or talk to people who do financial investment, the relationship is really, really important. You may not have been in a frat, but think about what being in a frat is. If you don't like golf, you never played golf, think about what those people are about. The mindset there is very different. And that's a different mindset also than the clinical culture, which is a very hierarchy, authoritative culture, on the basis of the ability of the physician to influence the thinking of the patient. If you have confidence in your doctor, you have to be authoritative. Our culture is not like that. We're very, we're very leveling. If you ever want to know an MD, PhD, which side of the fence he comes down to, use your hand in the middle of a seminar and ask him a question. If he kind of gives you a stare like, hey, I'm in the middle of my talk, that's an MD. <laughs> if his eyes go sideways, he's a little noisy, he has to go sideways and think about what you said, that's a PhD. We're leveling in our culture, the PhD culture, the basic research culture. Anyone can ask a question. That's not true in the medical culture. They're trying to change that. So you have to be, you have to be, uh, some people do come down. They can be ornery PhD oriented <laughs> types. But uh, these, I, what I want to, the point I'm trying to make is the cultural differences there mean a great deal. You have to get to know the people that are going to support you, the entrepreneurs. When you're in a laboratory and you work at a small institute, you have a chance for relationships, I think, that are, can be deeper and more fluid than they could be at a university where you have a certain role to play. It has to do with your academic and scholarly roles. You're a little more confined. You may not want to access that if you're at a small institute, but this is something to think about deeply and I think is going to be important as people begin to think about themselves as inventors uh, rather than discoverers. One of the advantages here is also the opportunities for self-reinforcing support long-term as possible. If you and your colleagues or your board members, or the people that support you at companies like what you're doing, and they see some benefit from what you're doing, they're in a position to reward you, to pay back. I know I do that. I, I try to make donations and support organizations I like. When you're in a position to do more of that for yourself, you can begin to generate a self-perpetuating culture. These are also things that we can try in the smaller places that we never would really have the same chance in a big organization where it's someone's job to do that, the development group, or the, you know, the business development group, or the tech transfer office, that kind of thing. The policies that we put in place at Lankanar are not that uh, uh, different than many places do for encouraging this. Our patent policy is uh, such that if an inventor comes and says, look, I just disclosed an idea on your form, and uh, uh, are you going to patent it? I, mean, I think this is patentable. The institute has two months to figure out whether or not it wants to apply for a patent. If it doesn't, then the invention, the disclosure, reverts to the faculty upon their request. It's their discovery. It's not the institute's anymore, and they can go decide what to do with it. Now, if you want a patent, it'll cost you a little money. It'll cost some money out of your own pocket or some of your friends, but it's yours. We also try to support this and say, think about ways you can invent, that in ways that someone would license. We want inventions that are licensable, and we're going to share uh, revenue share with the faculty. So I think ours is at 100,000. You would share half for a license fee or royalty at 300,000, you would get 20%, and everything up from there, you would get 20%. So we're trying to literally enrich the staff and the faculty who invent, that are inventors on the patent, with the idea that that'll motivate them to do more of this, and they get more of the benefits of their own work, and you can begin to incentivize someone who can't get a grant, and says, what else am I gonna do, and why can't my ideas be more impactful to me, to my program, to my staff? This is one way we begin to think about that a little bit. And this is a little bit more like a small company would think, too. So that's, we are trying to capture some of that thinking that's optional but available to our staff and our faculty. We have a, a bonus plan in place. This is probably going to be updated again, I think, if we're successful. But right now, if you can cover most of your program costs, we will turn some of the funds that the Institute gets back to you. And you can put it into your lab if you want. Uh, a lot of this generates financial conflict of interest. The realities of the day are, if you're an NIH supported investigator in particular, there's only so much uh, you can do that you uh, 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 can keep private. There's very little privacy in the world generally, as we've all found out recently. Uh, but for financial, everything has to be reported. That's a non-limber financial interest. We encourage our faculty to go out and be consultants. We think that develops reputation. We encourage them to start companies, to be involved with invention. But we want to know about what we're doing because it's very important we stay within what the guidelines are for uh, um, uh, PHS policy so that uh, we watch to see if we're an employee and the employee is a nonprofit investigator, we don't contaminate too much of that activity with a for-profit activity that could change what they say and do. 
Now, to me, my own perspective here is the person under the most conflict is the guy who has his last grant up for competitive renewal. There's a lot of pressure on you ethically and psychologically at that point. That's a risky part. There's a tendency to look at the same for for-profit activities. Having worked in the for-profit sector, I can tell you there's plenty of ethical people in the for-profit sector. It tends to be blackballed, especially in the world we come from, which is the nonprofit sector. But there are values and benefits in each world. What I want to leave you with is the idea that there's a lot of value we could capture from the for-profit world in a hybrid model and try things that work and fit them to the cultures and the faculty that we have in forming what would be a new culture that's not one or the other. To try and remove some of the chance of contaminating our own culture, we have created in LDI a for-profit that takes, through a master license agreement, all the inventions out that are designated by the institute, and they go into a different entity and are handled for the for-profit part. So we don't have a tech transfer office here with an officer that works for the institute. We have somebody that works for the for-profit. The for-profit is owned by the system, but it's a separate entity, and it's got its own goals and missions, and it's handled different in a tax status. So all the IP and technology that's out licensed go through LDI. It commercializes our research tools. It manages the biotech incubator. We don't make decisions about the biotech incubator. We make space available. LDI manages it for us as our manager. And we use it for marketing. We use it for marketing in conversational ways that we might not do because we're a scholarly institution. And we don't want to say, hey, this is a great new research kit. Or Dr. So-and-so has a great new procedure for doing uh, bypasses. But we would do that on LDI. We would talk about, say, hey, look, Dr. So-and-so. This is a little bit what a hospital would do. So again, we're trying to push some of these activities that are frankly marketing oriented, frankly commercial, out of the institute into a different place so that we can separate those activities and grow them differently than we would in the manner that the institute would by trying to focus itself more on the issues of uh, uh, what a traditional nonprofit would do. The equity and space for service here where we share, our lawyers tell us we can get up to maybe 15 to 20% of the floor space and as long as those companies don't generate too much revenue for us, in other words, they begin to make us look like a for-profit because it's so successful. The way we handle this to some degree is once companies are successful, we expect them to graduate, move out, get their own site, go to a real incubator as a science center or something where it's just for-profit activity. So we kind of hatch them in a warm place. And at the part where they start to look like they're going to be profit, we want them to leave. We take the investment that we took in them and we put it aside for our own discovery. We make sure we don't have too many people that are getting too rich while they're around. We want them you know, to be successful commercially, but we may not want to be taken over by that culture, by that, that impact. So LD, LDI is designed to try and do that. There are separate websites, there are separate activities, there are separate uh, groups. The faculty are engaged on some degree uh, on a committee that helps us decide about patents, for example. But uh, um, again, here we're trying to parse but still live with each other. Uh, the vision I had when I came really had to sell the faculty, I think, in the system on uh, quality in research and education married to what we were going to try to do that was new. I think brand convergence is something we all have to think about. And by what brand convergence I mean is we're small. We're very granular. The world, I think, is headed toward a future where we're all consultants. You know, we all have different ways to work in which we're pulling in income and relationships that produce a life that's different. And it's not unified. You don't have just have one person that gives you a paycheck. You don't have just one thing you do. And you think about what a traditional academic might have done in research two or three generations ago. He would have taught, done research in the summer, as some of you do here. He would uh, have written textbooks that he might get royalties on. He might do tutoring. He would supplement his, his, the practical activities in the life with his own scholarly life in a way that was, that was practical. In the same way, the institute has to create partnerships that can do practical things as well as things that are scholarly and it has to produce a vision that has real impact, but doesn't forget about its scholarly capabilities. And here I want to emphasize too that I walked into an organization that had a lot of senior faculty who were accomplished, NIH funded. They had a rather skeptical view of all this and it had to be broken in for a while until you could develop some trust and they could see, you know, this is not so bad. It can be controlled, there is some value here, and now we can begin to sort of settle into a new mode. It doesn't have to be violent. It took us really five years to begin to get this idea across. It didn't happen overnight. And to capture the overall vision, we really wanted to do some things to make Glimmer a stronger place to do what would be nonprofit, if you like, development strategies for impact in science. Where we had discovery and we were trying to do things clinically and preclinically. But we also had what I would call a venture capitalist strategy on top of this. And that would be thinking about therapeutics we could hatch out or spin in early, think about tests and devices in the middle, because the regulatory path to market is shorter, and then find. Think about things that don't need a regulatory path because they're already FDA allowable, medical foods, supplements, things like that. 
So if you're a venture capitalist and you have 10 years to make an investment of monies you raised and then you want to get a return, you're going initially to look at the things that where your long money goes. That's where your biggest hit could be, but it's also it's going to take you the longest to find out. It's where your highest risk is. And then you work downstream until you've invested your money in things that have a shorter time frame and are less risky and maybe have less payoff, but can be done uh, along this kind of time frame. Again, separating these two mindsets into two different organizations that work together. And doing this not only with ourselves, but also with biotech companies that we spun in, that were therapeutically oriented, device oriented, or uh, public health and supplement oriented. Uh, this it turns out to be a little bit more difficult to do because companies are not incented to do as much research if they can already sell something. Why should they care if they do a clinical or preclinical study to learn more? Well, they care a little bit, but mostly they want to get to market. They want to get a return. So this turns out I'm learning to have a little bit more challenge and difficulty in the equation is a little bit more here. This is more traditional in the sense that these companies have to go through certain kinds of particular um, milestone events in order to be successful financially and in terms of their clinical or regulatory development. And they're, the, the, it's an equation that's, I think, more familiar in biotech. And for us, to me, I saw this as something that was years. So initially, the first strategic plan was to enhance the science. And I think you're seeing here this here in MDI, which is, I think is a fantastic uh, place in terms of the science it's, it's doing. Uh, it was really enhanced entrepreneurialism later. Now, we did start some things here, but the focus the last few years has really been to push this, to get product development in every lab, for example. Finally, we're just entering the phase now where it's under, uh, uh, I think this is the, the, where the rubber meets the road. Do we really see more revenue? Can we feed ourselves uh, monies that can lead us in the longer haul maybe to get away from the NIH, which to me would be wonderful because it would show that we could self-sustain by our own work, our own vision, and, and not have to rely so much on grant writing which frankly steals the time of a lot of talented scientists in ways that they could much better use if they were in the laboratory and didn't have to concern themselves so much with uh, the grantsmanship and the grants chase. So where we're really trying to go is a little bit is in, in spirit like Xerox Park or Bell Labs, which were great science but also great invention. This hasn't really been done in biotech yet, but it has been done in the hard sciences. Um, in phase two, you know, mature this shift. This is also a trust phase because although we introduce it here and people get to see it, um, I think uh, to get everyone involved and to get the culture into a place where everyone buys in, it takes a while and there's still some trust that has to happen here. And then I think this is really important for the boards and the system. Okay, this is all really good, but does it produce anything? And that's really what we still have yet to find out. Now for us, thinking about therapeutics, you have to think about how to treat molecules to treat diseases, how drug discovery is done. And we've put into place um, infrastructure that I think makes this possible in a way that wasn't uh, some years ago. So we have a much more sophisticated vivarium for genetic models of disease, uh, uh, looking at the genes we're interested in, and then preclinical testing with small molecules, either medicinal chemicals or antibodies, which we got from acquiring a library and setting up an LCGC, as I'll tell you labor, later, but basically a chemical diversity that we owned, and also a center for uh, hybridome and antibody technology that produced both human and mouse antibodies that could help us think about ways we could treat. I'll tell you about the human antibody technology. It's really interesting that came out of the labs. And by the biotech startups and the incubator, begin to talk to people who know how to do this and are going to have to do it if they're going to be successful themselves with LDI support in managing what was going to be this incubator and generating some of this culture back here to make people think about that as they were getting started. For Limmer, which is embedded in a hospital, we had to think also about how to do things better clinically. Typically, if you can get out to an investigational new drug application, uh, you still have a long way to go, and this is the expensive part. This is where you need the company. For us, though, we also needed to have a clinical research center to support by biostatistics, by clinical coordinators, um, reviews of uh, um, IRB protocols that was more sophisticated than we had. Uh, we needed a regular regulatory affairs office that had standard operating procedures. We ran the phase three trial uh, the first five years of a new drug called Pradaxa, the first new blood thinner in 60 years. And uh, Mike Ezekowitz, the physician who uh, headed this up, was the PI for the NDA that had 18,000 patients in it worldwide in Lankanaw. This was a major trial and it forced us uh, to put in place a regulatory affairs office that the FDA could come and vet. It's like having a Columbo visit your institute for like seven or eight days. These guys <laughs> see which, how many different things they can find that's wrong with you. We actually passed this with, with flying colors and it left us with an infrastructure that now is far more bulletproof than it was 10 years ago. And I think encouraged the clinicians in a way that uh, began to get them some trust in the idea, hey, 
Glimmer knows what it's doing. I don't know who your customers or your clients might be in the same way, but that's something to think about here as you think about, well, where are we headed? Where are we trying to go with our science practically? It may be clinical, it may be other clients, but for, for me, I guess one of the things we learned was that was a big deal because all of a sudden the clinicians, our main clients, where we wanted to go, they were saying, these guys seem to be able to do things right. We've set up centers for translational uh, projects uh, in cardiology, which is a real strength overall at Lankanol clinically, and cancer uh, research, which is less well known clinically, but is very strong at Limmer. And we have just now, after 10 years, consolidated all the clinical research teams at the hospital in the institute itself, so we can have the nurses living with the scientists and not just living in the clinical space and capturing what we think can be more efficient activity uh, there. So this has been a long road, and it, it, this has really had, I would call, all on the nonprofit side of the equation that helped us build the trust to make it possible to get, to get make people think about uh, uh, the new aspects of what we were trying to do with the biotechs and, and the rest. So if your biotechs are successful, usually by the time you're in this phase where you're getting these kind of data, this is where you're going to be bought. Some biotechs really go all the way and get to market. That's very rare now. We were very fortunate to have a biotech we work with that did that and is now on the NASDAQ. But this is a very difficult thing, and from a financial standpoint, it doesn't make sense to, for a lot of companies to go to market now. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley makes it very, very difficult for a company to think about getting there. So in general, the big fish eat the little fish. That's the way this is going to work. So you have to set yourself up for a client who will buy you. That usually is not happening until you get clinical data, but sometimes it can happen preclinically or if you're working in markets where uh, it's not necessarily a clinical story. The clinical approved protocols that we were supporting at the hospital did go up as we got more and more capability and capacity to support more. We were also helping the hospital to recruit clinicians who wanted to do research. And we were doing it, I think, at lower risk where the system itself was concerned about the uh, legal risk of clinical activity. So this was also something, I think, in the hospital that has, been, uh, has encouraged us. And everyone uh, in the faculty could see uh, that as we were putting together teams and bringing in resources and doing all this, we were publishing more. And not only weren't we publish, was that happening, but we were getting impact factors to go up. A lot of this actually is due to the clinical research. The basic research uh, uh, ISI factors have been in this range. You know, they, they vary. So most of this increase has been because we're getting a little better, I think, in getting our clinical research, which tends to get cited more heavily uh, in the medical literature than the basic stuff. But the reason I'm telling you all this is just to say a lot of this is trust building. You have to show you that you can do, for the, for not because not all of you may want to get involved in this. Uh, a lot of the people who you may want to work with, they, this is reputational. It's saying the solid, the, you have a solid base from which to work to do something that's new, and they can begin to buy into it. The evolution in the expectations within the faculty, translational perspective is one. We had to make some changes in people who just said, look, I'm not going to invent. I'm not interested in this. I'm a basic fundamental scientist. And uh, I said to them, well, you need to be at a university. If you're, really, if you're really interested in knowledge and validation, that's it. Uh, you need to be at the Institute of Advanced Science, for example. Uh, this is not the right place anyway. We're at a hospital. Uh, we have to do something practical. So there was some storm and drang around this idea. Why do we have to have a translational perspective? Couldn't we be a, a hospital associate institute that does pure science? And that was, that was on me. That was, that was a decision I felt we had to break in and the trust building was part of that, but at the end of the day, it had to be a decision by some of the faculty. Invention and product development, I wanted it in every lab. I want every lab to have invention so it finds other ways to support itself in the longer haul. I wanted to support corporate consultancies. The system is still a little nervous about this. What are our faculty are going to work for other people? I said, well, they review grants, and they work for the NIH and get paid a little bit, and they write books, and they write book chapters, and they get honorary when they speak. Why shouldn't they have a little bit of a consultancy going where they're doing something that's practical in the world? Uh, venture philanthropy, for example, at foundations is becoming uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon because foundations like the American Heart Association are finding out, oh, the small companies, they're the guys actually changing the world. The scientists, yeah, we like them too, but you know what? They really can't seem to get all the way out to the impact we want. So again, you know, trying to get into this mode where everyone's used to the idea, including the system, that, hey, we're all going to be consultants. We're going to push on the practical side. That's what part of this involves too. And there's some return here. Again, the FCOI is an issue has to be watched. Uh, as you can imagine, the senior legal counsel in our health system is very interested in monitoring this. But at my role, I want to champion this. Financial conflict of interest. So uh, for those of you who uh, may not know, there's now a policy from PHS for NIH, basically, uh, that uh, um, encourages, well, requires, if you're an NIH-funded investigator, <laughs> used to be encouraged, uh, you disclose your whole life. 
So not only you, but your spouse and your, uh, um, your dependents. Uh, anybody who has an interest in a company that you're working with has to be reported so it can be vetted by the institution you're at uh, uh, and may have implications for whether or not you should even do that work. So there's, again, some storm and drang about what's conflict and what isn't. To me, and this is my own perspective, the conflict is very great in the nonprofit world. We just don't like to talk about it. It's a dirty little secret. There's conflict from these for-profit activities. What I may do affects what goes in my own pocket or my group's pocket or my institute's pocket. Yeah, those things exist. But where to draw the line is something that I feel like I want to champion this. I want to push this out a little bit more as we sort of figure out where the line is. And I think that's true culturally in, in, in research generally. Um, we gradually did get to the point where we figured out every resident faculty has some kind of project they can develop. Sometimes it's they have kits. This is a cell counting kit that came out of work in cellular biochemistry from our INA. Scott Desain had human antibody technology, so he can, it's very easy. He would make therapeutics. Uh, antibodies are a lot of what's down here. Sometimes they're therapeutics, sometimes they're kits. But we were able to tease out things we, if we couldn't invent, we would work with a company, and I'll give you some case studies, where they wanted something and we weren't there. We combined something they protected and something we had either protected or not protected and found an invention that we could license to them our part and they could take it ahead. Uh, so we, I wanted to have these sort of long-term plays in every lab. Now, for some lab, what we came up with was uh, for uh, Gans and Yan, this is a guy who's interested in uh, heartbeat. He uses the rabbit wedge model to study the effects of drugs on heartbeat. He's a cardiologist. We said, well, a lot of drug companies want to see if their compound has cardiac toxicities. Let's set up a surface model. So on the LDI website, you can now say, well, I wonder if my compound is going to foul up heartbeat or cardiac function. Very common way for drugs to fail as they get th through clinical development. Well, GAN now raises some money because he can provide services by contract to a variety of companies that want to, uh, to do that. And uh, uh, we even have a faculty member who, uh, we couldn't come up with anything, but she knows everyone in China, I think. So we're using her in medical tourism to advertise people to come and get services from the hospital. So you, know, y y you may have to be really out there and creative, but the notion here is we want to find other revenue streams that have a business orientation, whether it's related directly to your work or an offshoot of your work or something that's really out there in the case of uh, uh, Lee Zhang here. Yeah. Within this first 10 years, less than 5%. That's the reality right now. Uh, I have a picture, I don't think I put it in the talk here, of the first $200,000 check we got from the earliest one. So we're just now, when I say we're at this stage where it's starting to turn over, this was a longer road. I, I actually don't think you guys may have as long a road just because I was trying to integrate a lot of this into a clinical culture. That culture had to change. The system had to change. I mean, it was a much bigger sort of turn the Queen Mary. You guys are, have a lot more autonomy here, and I think you can move faster, likely, than, than, than I could. Well, let me come back to that because New Link is the one I really think, that's the guy that got out to NASDAQ, that if we get a 10 to 30 bagger from it, we'll have 20 to 40 million. And for a little place like us, all of a sudden that's a game changer, you know. And uh, that's even before we get to the royalty because we, owe the, we own the stock. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. I know I'm probably running over a little bit here. Some new things we now talk about is like, uh, could we kidify something? It's very common when you have a lab trick you have. You, see, you want to put it online. Hey, other people could do this better. We actually made the box and put the tubes of the stuff in here, and then we went to a company and said, can you sell this? You know, here's the protocol. Here's the lab data sheet. You know, the thing you would get from the biotech you work with, uh, in vitro gen or whoever. This is actually not that hard to do. And the people in that world are like, yeah, we can sell it. You know, they, they could see it. They don't have to read your patent and read your paper and figure out what tubes go in there. And, you know, it makes it really easy. Here it is. So Kitify is something we talk about a lot now of something we might do that's a tool that could be sold without the FDA and all the rest of it. This is just a you know, research product in this case. When would you corporify something? Where should we spin out? To me, I guess in the long term what I've learned is don't make a company if you're not in an engineering problem. If you can already see where you want to go, you have the lead compound, you have what you think looks like the product, and now it's box checking to get to the IND, the toxicity studies, the farm, you know what I mean? This is what a company's good at. If you're like, well, we're not sure what the product is, or we don't know what the platform is, like that's not a, you're not a company yet. So thinking about corporifying or partnering, uh, to me, this is uh, one of the things, I guess, as, an, as, a, as a knife edge that uh, we've learned along the way. So now we look at some of our projects the way a biotech would, and we say, well, how far along are we? What are the key go, no go questions? A lot of the things that you'd recognize maybe if you ever worked in pharma or biotech. And uh, this is now a conversation that I don't think we could have had 10 years ago because no one wanted to have that conversation, didn't think it was practical or meaningful to their lives. But now we do this sort of thing. So we're trying to move our projects 
some of which are going to fall out, and then trying to figure out where we have to go. So a lot of this is really LDI activity. And this is not something that you know, is part of the Limer activity, but it's part of what the executive and the people that are in LDI are trying to do to encourage the faculty or help them or think about this, this kind of stuff on the side. We've had some students from Penn, for example, we have some students that are half business at Wharton and half uh, uh, biology majors, want to be pharma guys or something like that. So I mean, we, we sort of cobbled this together in different ways that I think um, in presentation of what we're trying to do helps us think about uh, the practicalities in a way that's LDI and that's, that's different from Limer, but that we all can see. So, you know, to come back and to close this part, I mean, this is really where we're at, and we have to get to, uh, you know, is this really going to work? Well, some of the earliest companies that were mainly uh, um, uh, 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 drug-oriented, well, we had a couple of the diagnostic companies catching up. Those are, that's an easier market. Have had some successes, and these are now companies that were started and are either moved out or soon to move out. Um, this was a faculty startup around our IDEO drug technology. This modulates immunity in cancer patients and other settings. And it's uh, just opening uh, phase two trials now. The company we started was bought by a company that was private, but managed to IPO on a kind of a <laughs> very interesting, numerologically interesting date. And uh, we own part of that company. New Link had a vaccine technology. They bought our IDO technology, so they have two main technologies. Their vaccine technology is in phase three. One of the benefits I, I guess I learned was if you want an out license, don't go right to the company, start a company, and make your partner buy the company. You can get part of their stock if it's a stock deal and trade. And if they have any other technologies, now you have a basket. So you've hooked your cart to their horse, if you like. So New Link is having some success with their vaccine, and that's mostly what's driving their market value. Our stuff didn't really have come to bat yet. We're phase two. We're not having a big valuation impact on the company yet. But their stuff is. So even if our stuff washes out, if New Link's vaccines work, our stock's still good. So that's, I guess, one of them. I'll walk through that in a little more detail. That's one thing I would recommend is thinking about is if you start companies, uh, or, or if you're thinking about out licensing, don't. Think about whether you want to start a company and make your partner buy it or partner with that entity. CureDM was a, a diabetes treatment. Uh, we have space that we offered this company. We have equity as a result. These guys are now just getting into phase 1B. Uh, they had a deal, $300 million with Sanofi, uh, which kicked it back to them to do more with a change in management. But I think there's still an option to get into that. So this is something that uh, we have high hopes too. The valuation here is uh, stronger than this is at the moment, but I think this could move into this range uh, you know, if Sanofi comes back. Uh, the next uh, uh, couple of years, maybe. CD Diagnostics made a kit, looks like a pregnancy test, to look at joint fluid by an orthopedic surgeon. And you can tell right away in the OR if you have an infection by an antibody detection of what's in your joint fluid. Uh, this company already has its first product out, and because of the space we've offered it uh, around a clinical faculty member, we own a lot of that. And this one, I'd like to do more devices. I can see why the whole industry likes devices. Very much, much easier science, much easier business. And then finally, a handheld point of care you probably read about some of these in the news. We have one that uses a piezoelectric probe. A little bit of fluid, urine, saliva, blood, goes in the device. Within five minutes can tell you something. This company is developing uh, for infection, so they have an investment. Uh, we have a couple of our faculty advising this company and working with them around the antibody technology, which they didn't know as much. So these two companies differ in the sense that uh, they, th this was outside spin-in. This was none of our technology. This was one of our clinicians who owned the technology. Same here, owned the technology. This was technology developed by basic scientists. These are sort of the first guys out of the block and where I think we'll get the first read to see uh, how we do in a big way. Some case illustrations. Okay, so I already told you about the IDO trials. The IDO inhibitors look very exciting and we think that uh, the drug that we developed in collaboration with our colleagues at Georgia and NCI and New Link uh, 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 might be very useful for combinations with chemotherapy but also with Yervoy and PD-1 inhibitors and some of the things you're hearing about in the news that modulate immunity. This is a way into that problem. And some of the preliminary data already look pretty promising. So I'd already told you we had, uh, when I first came to Limer, licensed this into a startup. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, we're able to sell without clinical data. This was a very lucky for us with New Link and take stock. Uh, subsequently, there were other inventions at Limer that were made and that were put into LDI. And LDI was able to sell some of those assets, patents, and other, and other uh, assets out of the company. So the company remained, and we took stock back. So LDI had some stock. Oncorex inventors had some stock. Finally, the hospital foundation decided, hey, they have a pretty good story. We're going to also buy a little of their stock. So our foundation investment committee makes decisions. Maybe your board does, depending on what you may or may not have for endowment. But at for, one of the fortunate aspects of, our, of being at Limer was the hospital foundation supports us. They saw this as something they wanted to invest in, partly, I think, because we were invested in it. So the hospital foundation has a little stock. LDI has a little stock, essentially Limer, because we own LDI. 
and then finally our inventors. So this was the most complicated, but led to a company that has had the most success, and as I said, just uh, got out to an IPO, so there's real value in that now. Uh, the women who started uh, Pancreate, who were, were a basic scientist, uh, two endocrinologists, and a CEO, uh, they managed to get this company into a state through a series of CEOs that eventually got this to Sanofi uh, to uh, something that uh, may have some value, but at least got across the valley of death into phase one. With this company, we didn't own any stock or, or interest in it, so all we did was provide some space and services, and we got some equity in consideration of that. So we held some equity in CureDM. The IP was all faculty owned. This is the case of an incubator company that wasn't ours, but we helped, and we took some equity trading for space. Scott Desain's company, this was a case of a Jefferson faculty, a brilliant guy from uh, MIT, Brigham and Women's as an MD, uh, uh, wanted to have a company next to his lab, couldn't do it at Jefferson. Uh, we've turned out to be kind of Jefferson's tech space, I think, because of what Scott's done. But he had a company that uh, develops any human antibodies right out of a patient. So monoclonal antibodies out of a patient blood draw where the patients had a clinical experience. The idea being that there's very special antibodies there. So he's a you know, really wonderful platform here. Uh, he had external IP that was from MIT when he was, a, uh, I think, a postdoc uh, or maybe a young faculty member, some from Jefferson. And it took a while, but finally he was able to get that into Immunome, and he wanted to have this at, at, at Limmer. Well, you know, this was an incubator company, so we had the space and services and the consideration going for as long as that company's been here. We collect a little equity and trade for the space. Here I should mention, too, all the seats on the airplane are the same. Whatever we're charging the, the nonprofit researcher for overhead in his lab, it's $50 a square foot, we're charging that for the companies. It has to be the same because we're a nonprofit. We're not trying to leverage the space. It's our space. Whoever wants to come and work in it. Every one size fits all, it's all the same price. That's an important sort of legal consideration. We couldn't say, well, you know, those guys have to pay 70 because they're a company per square foot and we'll pay 50 for the nonprofit. It can't, it can't work like that. So anyway, uh, Scott's new IP then, whereas he developed it in his lab at Limmer, we had this sort of trail that the new IP could get into Immunome. So now we have some IP that I think, I think this is true, Worcester, we, that, that now is in, in Immunome. There was external IP. So this is a little different where we've managed to sort of uh, uh, piggyback onto what already got started in the IP sense as well as just doing the incubator model. For a faculty member who, like Janet Sawicki, had a nanoparticle that she was using to fight cancer. This is a DNA nanoparticle where she's expressing toxicity genes. They're looking in, among other places, ovarian cancer, working with Charlie Dunton here who's an ovarian uh, GYN oncologist at the hospital. Uh, the problem here was we had started to patent some of this with polymers from MIT, from Bob Langer's lab that Janet was interacting with, and uh, MIT fouled up the IP prosecution strategy. So they had polymer patents, and they had nanoparticle patents, and they had them at different law firms, and one of the patents got out published first, and then the prosecution of this patent was, com was compromised because they already published it here. So the patent examiner said, oh, well, you know, this is already prior art now because your own patent is, uh, has taken it away. So, Actually, MIT fouled this up, and what we thought we had patented wasn't patented anymore. Now we had a nanoparticle, but we couldn't get any patents on it because it was basically like it was in the public domain now. So these nanoparticles, although they are uh, still controversial, I think they have some cost of goods from my perspective, there are a lot of people who want to develop these. And Janet has some really spectacular science showing that she can go systemic with some of her nanoparticles. So we really wanted to protect them, and we began to look at formulation strategies. And there may be some relevance here for things you've already published, but you want to find a way to get it into the market, or maybe it's not your compound, and you want to find a way to get some IP around it. Formulation is one of these strategies. Pharmaceutical companies use this to extend patent portfolios. This was actually something that made sense scientifically just because Janet found in playing with different kinds of ways to get her nanoparticles around, the dendromer was more effective than the polymer she was getting from MIT as a way to target her nanoparticles. So she was excited about the science here, and the company that had these uh, 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 dendromers, Genosphere, was very interested in working with groups like uh, 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 Janet's. They want to use their dendromers for all sorts of applications. So what happened was here that Janet was able to use their proprietary dendromers with her nanoparticles so we could get a co-invention. Say, so here's a new kind of formulation, if you like, of a nanoparticle. And then from that, we were able to license to Genosphere uh, uh, back all the rights to that nanoparticle. So basically, we found a way to protect here. And in trade, we got consideration for that piece. Basically, what it means is they paid us something. So this is another kind of strategy when you're thinking about uh, technology that may not be patentable, or you may want, not want to patent for a while. There's still ways to find patents, and then hand it off to someone to take the risks who may want to develop. So you have to find that company. But fortunately, formula companies like this are looking for places they might be able to use their formula. So they're collecting patents and spreading out their risk on different products that they think might work. 
So those are some, just some snapshots of the kinds of things you can begin to think about business-wise that can marry to and don't necessarily have to foul the science you're doing and can make them more practical. Uh, just put those out there for your consideration. In closing, I want to suggest a couple of collaborative opportunities between our two institutes because I think there's a lot here that I saw today that was spectacular from the faculty and I have to really congratulate Kevin for what I think is a very vibrant uh, organization you're putting together here. Um, one of these is a formula strategy. This is uh, a compound we began to be interested in because of some work with a small company uh, that had made cosmetics that have uh, um, uh, made use of what's a stabilizer, what's called an excipient compound in the drug industry. So this is an old compound that's sorbitol related and it's used as a drug formulant, uh, FDA allowed, it's benign, it's not metabolized in the body, you can take it orally or give it IV. And basically it's a sort of a shelf life stabilizer. So it can be used for biologics or antibodies or small molecules. So Dynamis had studied this a little bit and they found that it itself looked like it had some activities against glucose. So oxidative types of glucose, deoxyglucosone, that can damage the skin, they found that maybe megalamine was reducing this. And we began to talk to them about looking to see, well, is there, are there anti-diabetic properties of this, given that it's lowering a, a reactive glucose uh, problem in, in diabetes patients. So in mouse models, we were able to show, yeah, there was some very interesting aspects. Sorbitol, it turns out, does lower blood glucose. You can't give it clinically because you get diarrhea. So looking at sorbitol derivatives had made some sense here, and we have a, a paper uh, that's uh, out. But um, really surprisingly also, we found there was effects on muscle. So glucose gets regulated either by insulin-dependent pathways or by insulin-independent pathways. A big one's exercise, but no one really understands the mechanism here. So the mice seem to get a little more stamina, and there's actually some clinical anecdotal experience. Uh, there's some people around the institute who have tried this stuff, and uh, it, you don't feel as much exertional stress. So I mean, this is something that's almost like a supplement. The FDA told us we don't want an IND. We've already approved this. If you want to use it, use it as a supplement in a monograph setting, you know, where you formulate something, basically. So this might be something that you might want to formulate. I talked to one of your faculty here about aging and, and glucose, and there may be some science here, but there may also be some formulant strategies here, and we're, we're interested in, in sort of throwing these around with a few places where we think there may some, be some helpful benefits here that married to something else uh, that could be useful. The second thing I want to leave you with is LCGC. This was really an effort on Mel Reichman's uh, part, the uh, CSO of this company and myself, to try and marry what is this huge chemical collection that's medicinally valuable in the pharmaceutical industry to all the proprietary and non-proprietary bioassays that live in the academic and the nonprofit world. So much of what's screened in this world is not medicinal and not practical. Pharmaceutical industries have spent decades putting together collections of compounds that avoid toxicities and avoid problems and no and, and they have collections that are not like those you'll find outside. They're also under-monetized. They're not, you know, if you have uh, two million compounds at Glaxo, they're running 50 screens a year. And half the compounds they have have never hit in any assay. Why not begin to drill for oil in Oklahoma besides just the one county you're in, spread it out. So LCGC was designed to be an agent to format, compress those compounds and make them available to academics. This was an NIH goal as part of the roadmap years ago, but they never were able to achieve it because they couldn't get term sheets that everyone could agree to. Mel has had the patience of a saint in working out that, not, the t not only the technology, but the business part, in getting a term sheet that actually a pharma would sign and academic partners would sign. He's, he's, so he's really just the Hollywood agent. He's trying to get these two together, and what he's providing as a service is a machine that can compress and make it cheap to screen here so that these guys don't have to spend too much money and these guys don't either, and that they can also veil. And I'll, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about that if you want to hear more. I have a picture. So here's the device. This was a kind of another kind of experiment. We built this robot. Mel had worked with me at DuPont and at Ligand out west, and he had some ideas about what he wanted to do. Had some engineers came and built a robot that's running very slow here. It runs in a freezer, and uh, it carries uh, compound collections in a device that can store 10 million. This is sort of like the mainframe computer of uh, all the uh, uh, chemical diversity in the world could uh, nearly fit in this one machine, which is uh, about uh, 15 feet tall and maybe uh, 12 feet square. Uh, so this machine uh, uh, can mix, and it uses a pop technology to move things. It doesn't have to, you don't have to freeze thaw to mix up compounds, and it can do random access. So it's kind of a neat thing because you can store lots of samples, and it can handle big collections, and we're, we want to micronize this with the, uh, the engineers. Uh, I don't know whether out here you have any other applications where you have to handle big samples. Water samples, for example, is one thing we've talked about environmental. Um, you collect all of them, you can have them there to go back and test, and you can pull out the ones you want. Uh, we're doing this with chemicals, but there's a lot of complex collections to be used. We haven't explored any of that. 
but what I'm proposing here is that we actually take advantage of our own library. So we acquired a library from FMC that was a bioag library. I come from, had been at DuPont that had bioag libraries. I can tell you there's a lot of interest in medicinal content that's not covered by pharma, some of which is. We have a, a very well annotated library. And making that available to a screener, uh, we can split basically the ownership. So some of the options can be made available are deals where we can help you screen pharma collections, but I guess what I'm proposing here is you could screen our collection in a compressed format where you can, uh, we, we mix the compounds and you can find combinatorial hits as well as uh, individual hits. If you ever played the game Battleship with your kids, uh, you know how this works. You know, we get mixed and we deconvolute uh, the way this works. So it's a, it's a compressed screen. There's some literature on this if you want to read a little bit about that that Mel is expert in. But uh, um, that's something I think in some of your assays we might be able to interact with. This is a real medicinal collection and unlike a pharma collection, uh, um, we're, 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 we want to split the ownership with people. Uh, these are things we think are leads that could be developed. We've done a lot of work already with a number of uh, academic labs uh, that have validated it and uh, we've gotten good uh, uh, structure of matter out of some of these. The labs have been very happy. Uh, Mel's got some grants. He actually got a Gates Award last year because of doing what I call reverse Chinese medicine. So in, since he mixes compounds, he can find individual molecular principles that added up will have activities that you wouldn't find individually. And you can do this where you keep one thing constant and vary everything else or do the mixes. Uh, his Gates Award was with a group in Australia for malaria, so they could find new combinations for malaria treatment. So there's a lot of science here and a lot of good technical validation. The business validation, which was, I think, actually the hardest work, and I'm not even spending that much time talking about it, is the, uh, uh, the, the, the term sheet. This was the tough part, but I guarantee you if we send your development officer our term sheet, you'll like what you see because we now have some heavy hitters that have come along and executed it with us. So this is the group of international that so far, Mel has a number of in the pot right now. But the bottom line is that a lot of people want to see either a pharma or our library or both mixed for the veiling purposes. I can talk a little bit more if you want to hear. I think there's a lot of validation here and I feel pretty confident now I'm beginning to go out and sell it and I apologize for having this sound a little like a commercial, but I think there's an opportunity here for collaboration between our institutes. So with that, I hope you get a sense of what it is we had set out to do and are trying to do. And you've seen a little bit of snapshots of how it is we're trying to do this and how we're trying, trying to change the culture with the long-term goal of having a more practical impact of our work in medicine, but also financially. With the long-term goal really of getting a discovery engine that'll make us more independent, develop an, uh, uh, an endowment that can support a small institute and make us less reliant on uh, the grants uh, chase, uh, the foundation chase, all the traditional ways uh, that were working in the boom times of the last 20 years, but now are petering out and uh, uh, need some support. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Glad to entertain any questions. done that extensively or formally, but done it informally. Uh, yeah, we don't have a specific mechanism. I haven't, I've never settled on that. I, I find I'm a little concerned about the politics. I haven't seen some of this in the bigger organizations of who gets the internal money. I don't know which is worse, you know, having the chair make all the decisions or having a committee make all the decisions. But to me, I'd rather have one guy. But the bias I have is coming out of industry. That's what makes things happen the fastest. I mean, the, one of the pleasures of being in an industrial or a, pharma or a biotech job is uh, the decisions are made very quickly and the resources flow very quickly. And there's not a lot of waiting around and you know, two years for a grant to come until you can do an experiment problem. Uh, that said, no, we don't have a formal structure. It may be something you guys may, you know, you may want to handle. We didn't, we didn't do it that way. Yeah. To follow up on, uh, on that question about mechanism, um, I know there's, a, there's a, a huge grant proposal right now between three academic institutions on the North Shore of Boston and an incubator at the Cummings Center, which is right where cell signaling technology and yeah. bio labs are. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that has come back for a second write up of this thing, it was um, the proposal was rejected the first time uh, from all these collaborative institutions, was that the, the funding agency wanted to know if there was some uh, guarantee that the biotech uh, incubator 
that was coming in to use the facilities at some of these academic institutions was going to be successful. So, you know, they wanted some some more information about that. And I just wonder, is there some algorithm or are, are there consultants out there that can choose the right biotech company for that sort of a space? I, I think you guys have the advantage of already having relationships in Boston that is a sophisticated biotech culture, financially, legally, uh, technically. Philly actually doesn't have as much as you have going on in Boston, I think. And uh, when you dive in and you start a company, and you guys have started one now here, you'll begin to use these as stepping stones to relationships too. I mean, so as a scientist, you're gonna to tend to think, well, I wanna start this because I have some friend practical where I wanna go, and the company is certainly gonna to wanna to do that. They have a, they have a mission. And, uh, uh, but from a, if you stand back and you look at this more broadly, starting these companies, they're like little stepping stones on the way to something you're not sure where you're going. And I don't wanna give you the impression that this is like, uh, there's no storm and drain here. I mean, if you're a researcher, there's only three people you work for today. The government, a financier, or a lawyer. You get to pick. You know, and it's gonna have a little bit of element, but you can go IP strategies, you can go, which is what we're doing basically, try to build LDI into a little uh, venture group almost, like a, uh, you know, holds a basket of technologies. Uh, or you can go after the public monies, and I would put in the, the philanthropists there as well, but you know, the, the nonprofit money. So there are you know, lots of problems there too, but as you start with these companies, they may fail, but you're gonna meet more people, you're gonna turn them on with the science, they're gonna be pulled in, and then there's gonna be a process, it's gonna evolve. So I would just sort of dive in the pool and get started and see where the relationships lead you. Because already in Boston, you have a vibrant mixture of people. You just have to let them know, hey, you're out here and you have some really cool stuff that's happening. And uh, uh, I think you're gonna see, again, you're in a somewhat more, I think, uh, vibrant position than I was in Philly. Philly's gotten better the last decade, but you know, you're already there in Boston. So I would definitely take advantage of those relationships. And maybe that's all the companies do, until you find the one that really takes off. Uh, and then you know, that becomes the game changer. For us, New Link might be that one, and we happen to hit on it early. We'll see, but at least now we do have stock that is millions. It's, it needs to be tens of millions before it's really going to be. Yeah, that's, uh, that's useful. Yeah. It's outside my expertise. Me too. <laughs> percent of the firms that start never wind up staying yeah. is that true today as well uh, well 80 percent of the firms who start that are supported by entities and experts that are not primarily scientists I mean one of the things I really am curious about to see what this model can do is whether they can increase the hit rate can we pick better than they can because they're picking companies they see people make pitches and they decide where they're going to put their money and a lot of their advisors are people like you. They had uh, scientific and technical background and then they went off and worked for a bank or a financial firm. There's a lot of these kind of guys that are out there at least that, that uh, I bumped in over the years and some of which have worked in my lab. So can we do better? I mean, we're the experts after all. Can we pick better? I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but so that's my first comment is that yeah, it's a one in five. And that is, I think that is pretty realistic. I think it's probably more like one in five to one in 10. The other thing is uh, a lot of this is pie in the sky and marketing. So when you talk about, and I'm gonna pick on some things I don't like, stem cell therapy, um, nanoparticles I used to pick on, but Janet keeps proving me wrong. Things I just don't think are marketable because they have too many cost of good problems, too many problems with the FDA, um, these kind of issues. I think a lot of what venture capital has done in biotech is pick things where they can build a buzz story and raise money around because that's what they wanna do. But their mission is not like our mission, which is, yeah, we may want that to some degree, but we want something that's also gonna move ahead. Can we pick better? I think one of the aspects of the entrepreneurial model that we'll get to explore is, can we do better than the way it's handed right now, which was tech transfer out to a company, they go away and you never see them and maybe you're a consultant to them, but they basically run the show the way they want to. You know, we're much more up to our elbows in terms of the cultural aspects of trying to manage what these companies are doing you know, and framing the buzz and all that kind of stuff that those companies have to do, but also keeping them a little closer to what I would call a technical home. Uh, this, may or, this may be naive or optimistic on my part, but I, I think we can't do too much worse than they do, uh, and we might do better. Yeah? Why do these clinical trials take so long? Does the FDA, do the FDA make decisions more quickly? Do they have not have enough manpower? You know, uh, right down the street from Lankanau is the Barnes Foundation, Albert Barnes, uh, who you might know because he made a huge collection of impressionistic art, the largest collection in the world. If you're ever in Philadelphia, go see his museum, which they've now got downtown. Uh, 
He made his money from silver nitrate solution to uh, cure infection in the eye. He had an idea, he tried it on a few patients, and within six to 12 months he was selling a product. It's not hard to make new drugs. It's hard the way we do it. I'm an oncologist and, and, and I'm starting to get a little more bold about being the annoyance of having an organization that controls every decision past a safety point, that's what the FDA was originally set up for, uh, uh, past a decision point where it's about the physician and, the, and his patient. Now the FDA has gotten, uh, I think, more open to outside judgment, and these guys are experts and they know what they're doing, but we have a fascist pharmacology system. Things are privately owned that are being developed, but they are fully publicly controlled. That's the operational definition <laughs> of fascism. And, and the problem is with these guys is that they need to get out the reason you go into CVS or you have people doing what uh, I know some of you are doing is managing your own diet and your own health with the available tools you have is because that's where the innovation is. So I like the supplements and the food stuffs and I'm trying to get into that area because you can innovate there faster. Clinical trials are not that long. They're long the way we do them with the confidence levels we want and oftentimes in areas where it shouldn't be in the trial anyway, for oncology for example. Um, trials have trouble recruiting, it takes a long time to get an answer. It's mostly because the drugs don't work. They work, you'll find out very quickly. Uh, we're still in a research phase of cancer where uh, uh, you know, we need to do things faster because we haven't figured this disease out. It's obvious we haven't figured it out. And you make these breakthroughs and it's months of survival. So to get, to get some, to convince people that you are doing better, you need big trials. You need a lot of statistics, you need a lot of patients. If the stuff is really gonna work, like Levec did, for example, in cancer, um, it'll go pretty quickly and it'll get out there fast. So this is one of the aspects of picking your projects. Where do you think you can win and then focusing your attention there and leaving behind the other stuff. Most of my lab moved out of oncogene signaling and into immunotherapy because I got convinced that was never gonna work. That's still the mainstream of the field and there's a lot of de dedication of effort there. But um, to be able to stick and move in these smaller places and pick some of this stuff, I think that's one of the sort of keys is how do you get around the FDA? And I'm speaking really frankly here. But if you're thinking about inventing, this is what you're constantly thinking. We have to deal with this bureaucracy and work with these people, or we have to find other ways that they'll allow us to work and uh, 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 get these uh, uh, kinds of uh, things that can be effective and don't need the uh, incredibly convoluted and highly regulated trials that we otherwise have to run. And I don't want to leave you in the, in the impression that Prendergast hates the FDA and it makes no sense. For cardiology trials, yeah, yeah I can see where the safety at every stage is important because you're treating a chronic disease where people might live through it anyway. I'm talking about cancer with metastatic patients that are going to die and pretty quickly with the more deadly diseases, they need to back off and just say, look, the phase one is done, whatever you guys wanna do from here, that's fine. I actually think we're coming to a time where if you're knowledgeable, you don't need these guys anyway. I mean, you get a nurse to infuse something, you can have a chemist make it in India, you can get that compound, papers are published. Do you wanna be part of a trial? Maybe not. Uh, most of the patients that are coming into our trials, I know, if they're really knowledgeable, they want to be on the experimental arm. Now, it takes a good clinician to explain to them why that's maybe not the best decision, and there's a lot of good reasons to, to want to be on the control arm. But the bottom line is I think people are getting much more empowered by what they're learning, and we're gonna see a breakdown of trials. It's gonna go faster, not because it's allowed, but because people are gonna do it anyway. So it, it's a really exciting time in some ways in, in biomedical research because we're gonna see places like the ones we work at and what's happening even in the world where people just run around these barriers and the rules change uh, very quickly as a result. It's, that's something I hope to see and that's an optimistic view of what otherwise would be pessimism. Yes? How do you see the recent change in patent law, the first to file business um, affecting what you do uh, versus what academics do? Uh, a patent is a tool for a scientist who wants to translate a principle to the real world because you have to deal with the expense of the regulatory infrastructure. You might not have to patent if the market could accept what you have and you don't need the regulation. Here I'm gonna to go to the hard tech industry. Uh, remember zip drives? You know, a lot of that stuff wasn't patented because though that industry goes through these changes where by the time you get the patent and you've done all the prosecution, maybe it doesn't make any sense to patent anyway because already, you've already blown past it. For us, I think because of the regulatory uh, situation we have to deal with and the money that's involved, you gotta have a patent to protect it. And you may wanna have a patent anyway, but I'm, I'm using that as an, you know, to make a point about uh, what it means to me as a scientist. For the investors, I think they uh, b do believe they'll get, get protection for a period where the invention is not gonna be displaced by another technology. And I don't always think that's a good assumption. I think uh, biomedicine's gonna get to the stage where there's gonna be a lot of competing products and a lot of 
uh, uh, competition that may make patents less valuable than they might have been where you had a breakthrough drug and you got 10 or 15 years out of it in, 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 in big money. Uh, those, those times might change too. That's going to take a little bit longer. I don't know if I'm answering your question about the uh, meaning of a patent, but to me that's why an entrepreneurial environment was useful. That's the only way I, you, know, you can get the investor in to put the two million to get your phase one trial, which is what it costs to do in, uh, uh, you know, to get out through the IND, the FDA, to get the patients, that first 20 patients in oncology. It's a, le it's a lever to doing that, to, you know, a fulcrum. One more quick question, and then there's a reception outside. I'm sure we'll be happy to entertain this question. Great, one more quick. Um, George, you have a community at, at uh, Lehmer of uh, resident scientists and collaborative scientists that are at, at Thomas Jefferson. Um, here we've got a community of resident scientists and collaborative, and collaborative scientists that are visitors. Uh, how do you build that community, the collaborative community between the two? Uh, well, I wish I could say that we'd done a better job with Jeff. We're part of the Cancer Corps uh, grant down there. We collaborate and publish together. We haven't really co-invented too much. What has evolved is that scientists that were at Jeff, one of the faculty there, that wanted to start a, fa a company, found it was easier to do it at Limmer. And so we've actually hosted a few companies now that are Jeff related, uh, or Jeff started, um, two of which were virtual. So they didn't even really take any space of significance in the labs. Um, we haven't done that well on that front. Like one of the ideas I'm bringing back from you guys is I think you have a model with the summer uh, faculty program where you're, you're, you could pull together people and bring ideas and labor together in a low cost way to do things that are, that are collaborative. It's kind of the brand convergence idea again. I mean, I think that to me is, is absolutely critical. It's like a co-op. You know, we're all consultants, but we have co-ops. You know, that's, I think, where we have to evolve those with the, with the smaller uh, entity. As a student, this seems really revolutionary, the marriage between uh, both scientific and business methods. But my school doesn't really offer courses um, to bring these two ideas together. Is there potentially a way for small businesses um, and investors to collaborate with large institutions to kind of cultivate these ideas um, in students? There are some places that are talking about this. And I know uh, I talked to Bob Morris, who's, uh, who's actually trying to put together a book. I mean, you remember when I opened my talk, I said, this is sort of the biggest experiment I've ever done. I, we're kind of making this up as we go along. There's not really too much out there. I think one really good thing to look at if you're interested in this as a kind of a model is a, a Harvard Business Review piece on Bob Langer. It's very famous, and it's got a figure in it about how his relationships have driven. So he's got his academic relations, his corporate relations, his financial, legal. And he's at, you know, he's at the center of the universe, this guy. He's a very sharp guy, but he's managed to put together kind of an invention domain that I think is illustrative and had a big impact on me when I was thinking, trying to think through some of these problems. A lot of this is also trial and error, like, you know, how can we solve these things? There's no formal, I don't want to give you the impression there's any formal thing here that we know is going to work. You know, this is, we haven't built the bridge yet. We are trying a different trusses to see which stands up and which doesn't. Uh, but uh, um, I think uh, in addition to the, uh, the Langer article, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, try to go online and see if anything from Stanford. So there are these massive one-line uh, courses now, what are the MOOCs? I think there's going to be some of this coming out of the Bay Area just because there's a lot of people out there thinking about this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Boston and, and Bay Area, I think, are where a lot of these, and there's other people that I'm not giving you anything that's maybe too unique here anymore. Ten years ago, maybe so, uh, but not now. Uh, uh, that's where I would look also and see what's out there that's online, that's a course as these things come about. Stay tuned. We'll be doing some of that. Later. All right, Bob. <laughs> All right, I want to thank George for a great seminar. And